Bienvenidos and welcome to Seeds of Social Change, a special series celebrating National Hispanic Heritage Month, which honors the cultures and contributions of both Hispanic and Latino Americans representing all Latino countries. My name is Andrea Garcia. I am the AVP of Advancement at Toro University. We're bringing you this series as part of our diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative to create a diverse and inclusive campus environment and community. Today, in our second series of three, we welcome Dr. Judy Castro, AVP of Partnership Development. As the Associate Vice President of Partnership Development at Pacific Oaks College, Dr. Judy Castro is responsible for the management and development of Hispanic Servant Institution grants, which she wrote and was awarded $2.5 million to support Latinx and underserved students attain their degrees. In addition, Dr. Castro has helped organizations across the globe understand that leadership can be developed by strengthening the connection between and alignment of individual leaders and the systems through which they influence organizational operations. She holds a doctorate in education with a focus on organization and leadership from the University of San Francisco. She is also a dear friend, colleague, as we have a little bit of a past together. When I was president of the Solano Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, I met Judy and she was just amazing, fascinated and a real, real dedicated person for the Hispanic Latino uh, community, and I have always been in awe. She served as a Northern Region Director for the California Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and she is now on the board for the foundation of the California Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And so, jo Judy, just so you know, we have three current and past presidents who are watching you today. We have Alma Hernandez, Doris Panduro, and of course, Maricela Barbosa, and with me, actually, that's four. So we are honored to see you, and I pass it on to you. Thank you. Now I'm really nervous now because you guys are going to be very, very hard <laughs> on my presentation. But, you know, um, thank you very much. Uh, I do appreciate the opportunity of being here uh, celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to continue to create that awareness of the goals that we have actually achieved in this country. Um, again, in celebration of the Hispanic Heritage Month, my presentation is, a, is about not losing sight of your goals. It's about dreaming, which is what this country is about and what it's possible. And it's also about believing that you can do it. And it's also about you taking action, taking charge and making it happen. We also need to acknowledge those who have taken the paths before us and those who have dreamed, believed, and have acted. We also need to acknowledge that Latinos, Hispanos are a contributing member of the U.S. economy. You know, we've heard that before, but I think we need to repeat it over and over again so that we do take pride in that. We bring a diverse culture with so much to offer. Let's start with food, right? Music, art, and innovation. Next slide, please. Next slide. The path, the slide before, <laughs> we'll get this one right. Thank you, there we go. The path that has been laid out for us, we need to be aware of what's around us and who has been there before us. And this is the acknowledgement that we take in Hispanic Heritage Month. Next slide, please. So let's get started. Demographically, we know that in the state of California, we are the majority. However, we are still the minority when it comes to decisions of representation in health, in education, and in politics. By 2040, we are projected that we will be 30% of the total US population and you ask yourself, should we, should we care? You know, and this is a question that I think that we as Latinos, especially in this particular month of celebration, is to really think about, should we care? Yes, we should care, especially when we need representation. 
we want someone that looks like us, someone that will make the decisions on our behalf, who understands who we are, who can appreciate the culture, and who understands our culture sensitivities and nuances. So this is why this whole month of celebration is important for us to continue to be aware of, to be reminded of, of who we are and what we need to do and what others have done for us. Next slide, please. Starting with the Civil War, Latinos, Hispanos have participated through the Vietnam War. So the path has already been laid out for us as far back as that. Next slide, please. Contributions of public service. The path again has been laid out for us in public service. We have two, I believe, two candidates uh, on this uh, presentation today. And so they understand the commitment that we have to take in order to ensure that our community is represented well when decisions are being made. So the path has been laid. They dreamt, they believed, and they took action. We're talking about uh, Henry Cisneros, Sonia Sotomayor from the Supreme Court. Next slide, please. So where do we start? We start with education. Education is the key to all doors. You know, I don't know how many times I say that over to students that I uh, come in contact with, of letting them know how important education is, because it is the key to all doors. We have done amazing work to date that we have actually gotten now ourselves into attaining an associate degree but that's still not good enough. Next slide, please. So we need, to, we need to take credit, and I do want to emphasize that, that we do need to take credit that we have made strides in getting our community, us, into an associate degree, but it's not good enough. And when we go into a four-year institution, because we believe that that is what we need to do in order to make a change in our lives. Things do happen. Life happens, right? But what happens to us then is that we stop dreaming. We stop believing. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, we do not need to take a break. Sometimes, you know, life does get in the way, as they say. But you do need to uh, ensure that you continue to dream you don't stop believing so that you can go back and continue that road. Next slide, please. So again, you know, si se puede y por qué no. So the whole emphasis of education, as we just said, is the opportunity. But it is for us to take an action to continue that. Next slide, please. I should emphasize that before I go into this particular slide, is that with our education, you know, now that we are in the four-year institutions, there are local, there are state programs, and there are even the Department of Education is understanding the fact that we are the majority, especially in the state of California, and that we are an impacting community that impacts the economy of the US. As a matter of fact, there is a statement that I have to read very clearly to you. Latinos currently are and will be increasingly become a critical foundation of support for the new American economy. Latinos are entrepreneurs. 
We all know. Roughly 33% of Latinos entrepreneurs are younger than 45, compared to just 22% of non-Latino entrepreneurs. So basically what we're saying is, for every 100 Latino adults in the US, 510 become entrepreneurs each month. Now, there are also statistics that talk about how small businesses fail. But if you are you know, informed, you are educated, you will be able to overcome the obstacles in what it is to expand your business, what it is to speak the language of those in business. What are your financials, how you read them, your business plan. Again, education is the key to your door. Next slide. From the taco, you know, stand. Next slide, please. To entrepreneurs. I don't know if you recognize these businesses, but Alberto Veta, Perez Zumba Fitness. He took on the exercise world by storm. I wish I could ask you all, can you all raise your hands? At one point in time, we all have tried Zumba. You know, some of us, maybe our hip just went out of shape a little bit, but we have tried Zumba. A Latino from Colombia. Next slide, please. An amazing individual who just created an opportunity for himself. Next slide. Jorge Perez. An Argentinian born, Jorge Perez arrived in the U.S. in 1968. He recently graduated from high school. He settled in Miami. And he started to build affordable housing in Miami. Next slide. He now focuses on high-end condominiums. And he is known as the condo king in South Florida. Un Latino. Un Hispano. They dream, they believe, and they act. Next slide, please. Carlos Castro, Todo Supermarket. From El Salvador, Carlos founded the Taco Supermarket chain back in the 1990s. Castro proves to be an ex, in a, in a, a special case in that he originally fled El Salvador and entered the U.S. illegally. Officials reported him and he tried again. This time, he came in legally and successfully immigrated into developing another empire. Next slide. I'm sure you've seen these markets again. A dream, a belief, and an act of taking charge. Next slide, please. Jordi Munoz from Tijuana. In 2007, he became to prominence after hacking the sensors of his Nintendo controller. I'm not suggesting we all go do that, but then again, you know, that belief in that faith and that acting of what, you're, what you come with, right? Next slide. 3D robotics for security. Assemble in the US. I'm just taking you through this, you know, view of these opportunities that are available to us, right? With just the thought. Un sueño a dream, una fe, a belief in ourselves that we can do. And then to act, hay que actuar, hay que tomar las oportunidades. We have to take on the opportunities in order to get to where you want to be. Next slide, please. Now, which is also very interesting about us as Latinos, entrepreneurs. 70% our funding comes from our own personal savings according to the Stanford study. So we don't like to, you know, 
create too much uh, debt. And so it comes from our own savings. What does that say about us? That we can plan, that we can organize. Just give it some thought. Next slide, please. I'm taking you through, so what I'm thinking is a memory, right, uh, of knowing the path that has been laid out for us with the first slide with the military from uh, World War I to Vietnam. And then also the, all of the entrepreneurs and the educational opportunities that we have. And yet we are also a power to be recognized in the U.S. Our purchasing power is over $2 trillion. I don't even know what that, how big that is, right? And yes, we are brand loyal. What does that mean? We don't like cheap things. We buy things that are worth the value and then we stick with it. And guess what? We also pay our taxes. So we are a contributing force. And so at the beginning of my presentation, I shared with you that education wise, we are not necessarily in, in the process of getting ourselves educated. And we need to continue that momentum. Yes, we've done well to get us to our two years. Now we have to get to our four year institutions, knowing very well that our, there are support systems in place that can help us locally and state and then those institutions we have been awarded a hispanic serving institution grant by the department of education next slide please. and i look at this and i say hmm, who isn't marketing to us everyone is marketing to us so think about who is in marketing to us? Next slide. Now, we have to come to a reality. Upcoming elections, nothing more than to say we need to vote. COVID-19. So everything that I have said sort of puts everything in perspective, right? Uh, entrepreneurship is on a whole. Should it be? There are other opportunities. I can say to you that the opportunity, so we have much more opportunities to attend versus having to travel or to leave, you know, your home and have to make arrangements for family, et cetera. So there are still opportunities within COVID-19, but I do want us to make sure. Next slide, please. Go ahead and click. COVID-19 is an array of confusion. I am not going to go into, you know, you should listen to anyone, but what I'm suggesting is you understand how you need to protect your family. Right now we are part of the high statistics that say that we as Latinos are very vulnerable. Because our culture, we like to be together. Yes, but that doesn't mean that we don't understand what it means to protect ourselves, correct? So there's a lot of confusion about the messaging that's going now. Next, click. It's also being overwhelmed. Information, just us being overwhelmed. Next. It's also a vicious cycle of information, vicious cycle of not knowing whether we are going to have a job, not knowing whether one of our family members is going to be ill, not knowing where our next uh, meals are going to come. Next slide. So this is an impact. All of these things with COVID-19 are impacts. They're impacting our way of life which is not the norm anymore. Children are at home being schooled 
we are now going out, um, yet we need to be careful. Yet there are those who do not and are not cautious. And I'm not going to get into what is and what isn't, but we need to be aware. Next, please. And all of this to me is just a, a mix of distractions from the entrepreneurship spirit, from the opportunity for us to continue to dream, to believe and for us to act that we can and that there are opportunities to continue to go to school, to start a business, to continue to provide and to give and to impact the economy of the US. So think about all of this. Next slide. So the message in this short uh, presentation is about giving you the opportunity to think through, to stay focused, to stay on your path. And those around you, especially educators, we need to keep that student engaged. We need to keep them thinking about why they're there, that they have a dream, that they believe them in themselves, and that they need to take charge of who they are and what they are and what they're doing. And then again, in the month of celebration of Hispanic heritage, is to be proud of who we are and what we have done and what we have achieved and what we still can achieve. But it's all within, right? From the Taco Bell to these huge building developers to computer boats, everything from one aspect to the other. And to those who are now thinking about getting into politics, wanting to make sure that they do have a belief in themselves and they want to take charge so that they can see equity throughout. So my message to you in Hispanic Heritage Month is to stay focused, stay on your path, dream, believe in you, act, take charge. Thank you. I'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, I have a question for you. When we're, you have extensive background in education. One of the topics that are really concerning to me is, um, and to many others actually on this um, webinar, ta let's talk about the pipeline coming into um, higher education and for example let's say whether it's in any of the programs that we we have at our university whether it's the health um, education public health how is that pipeline being built because by the time it gets to the graduate level it just seems like there's a bottleneck somewhere so I wanted to get your opinion on that having worked with undergrad students yeah you know what I think is is that the community has not been informed. The student body has not been informed. They do not know of the alternatives that are there. When you think about, um, and I'll give my, I'll use me as an example. Growing up, my mother had a very specific idea as to what we needed to do. And she immediately thought, you know, you can be a beautician. I thought, oh my God, are you kidding? You can be a secretary. I thought, are you kidding? I want to do more. I want to be something more. But it is the, uh, that we are not aware, that we do not know what it is that we can actually do. And so I think for me is that our pipelines do sort of fizzle out or reduce because that information out there is not available of the opportunities of the curiosity in the different fields that we can actually be in. So to me, is not building that pipeline long before we even get to that point for graduate level. And you bring up a, a great point with the pipeline. And that actually is a great segue into um, a question we have. Uh, the question is, I would love to hear more about your successful work around JFK becoming an HSI 
so would I personally, and how you secured the grant, I wanna hear about that too, for the Student Success Center. I met you a couple of years ago, and this is Dr. Lisa Norton. She's the Dean of the College of Education and Health Sciences. Uh, I met you a couple of years ago, and we had a great side conversation to discuss at the time, but the work has progressed since then. You know, with John F. Kennedy, um, it was a great opportunity. Uh, I did co-author that grant, and what was really difficult was at the beginning, um, because you need to be eligible, and eligibility is a requirement before you can even submit a, uh, a proposal to the Department of Education. Eligibility is that 25% of your total undergraduate population needs to be uh, Hispanic. What was interesting and what was going on at that time when we had received uh, an opportunity was in identifying our students. We couldn't find the Latinos. Could you imagine that? We couldn't find them. And I started to conduct some focus groups and uh, the students were saying, well, gee, this is, I've never seen so many Hispanics in one room. I thought, oh my gosh, what's going on here? Um, so that was in itself an interesting process of not, ident not having the students identify themselves due to immigration issues, uh, not maybe because they were not necessarily here, not illegally, but maybe their parents and or other families. So there was the stigma of immigration issues. And so it was very difficult to even get to that point of our 25%. But once I started to focus on that, we definitely exceeded the 25%. Um, and then building the undergraduate success center was also an opportunity because our Latino students could not embrace the fact that this center was specifically to support them, to support them with bilingual tutors and mentors, uh, to support them with equipment. And so it took a while for uh, our students to realize that the center was there for them, where they can actually network and socialize, where they could get uh, advising on how to navigate the educational system. So it took a while to do that, but it was through those efforts of going to the classroom, doing, um, having a, a, a table in the lobby, introducing their services, uh, greeting students, making ourselves available to them was an opportunity for them to realize that we were there for them, that all of these services were there for them to achieve you know, their, their goals. And then also to help them understand how to navigate. I mean, if you're having a family problems, right, or work problems, you can no longer take a full load. So then you talk to your advisor and you maybe take less of a load and you said, well, I didn't realize that I could do that. And so those are the opportunities. And uh, if you're failing in the class to ask, is there a mentor or a tutor that I can work with? And so those were the type of services that we actually reached out to the students in offering. Then we started to go out to the community because we knew that not only were we gonna support our internal community, which were our students, but also our external community. Our external community could be the same, but where the parents, were family members, were those in position to listen to us in understanding the value of education. And so those opportunities were that we took advantage of by going out and not doing uh, outreach, but providing educational outreach and awareness on the value of higher education. For John F. Kennedy, um, we did a podcast that is on Spotify and YouTube with a series of uh, topics introducing the grant as well as the services within each institution. We have speakers from uh, HACU, which is the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, giving us your perspective of the importance of the work that they're doing to support our Latino students. We have uh, 
people are speaking about Puente and what is that? What is it to be, you know, reaching out to a mentor and the relationships with them? So that is another opportunity in continuing that effort to introduce the value of higher education and that si se puede, y por qué no, right? So I hope that answered your question. I'd love to go on. <laughs> you can't stop me now. <laughs> You, you brought up something um, that resonates with me, and that's the Puente program. And I don't know if Solano College still has it, but it was going on if anyone is interested. And it's a great opportunity. Um, they look for people in the community, and we did it with the Solano Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and I know that they still continue to do that, to partner business uh, leaders with students from uh, the college in the Puente program. So and I know you had a big role in that too as well. So thank you for doing that. Um, we have a question from Maricela Barbosa and she said, um, and it's actually, <laughs> it's a great question. My concern is about connecting with Latino parents and educating them about the importance of getting an education. I'm still hearing moms tell their daughters, you need to work, school is not for you. You know, this is where that outreach comes into play uh, with our community. Uh, of, and it's sad to say, it's a story that we need to repeat over and over and over. Um, and we're still trying to break that, that nut, if you will, of having our parents realize how important it is right, to get a to get an education. So it is, Maricela, about going out again to the community, to the PTA meetings, um, even working with maybe Univision, which now that I'm thinking about that, I should follow up with them, and actually putting something together on why it's important that we cannot and should not keep you know, our daughters from going to school, furthering their education because it's not just about work. And then, you know, what ends up happening also, if that young woman is, is wanting to continue, she may be putting it off until she is able to do, you know, the routine that we all do, right? You work all day and you go to school all night, which is also fine. But I think that we need to begin, Maricela, with a, um, with a very focused outreach uh, with the school districts to inform, continuing to inform why it is so important for daughters to go to school. And I would hope that is not, you know, this whole thing with the machismo uh, tradition of, uh, of us saying only the young men go to school. They have to. We don't. We have to stay home and, and, and just get, uh, you know, uh, a job that is going to just bring in and support. We need to start to break that, that nut. It's a difficult one. It's one that uh, I think we, we struggle with quite a bit. Um, and then we think that we have made some strides. And then we go back again another few feet. So it's a continuing effort for sure. I couldn't agree more. And I see that it still goes on. Haven't experienced it myself. It's still there. It's still there. Uh, we have another question from Bill Hicks. What challenges exist in pursuing goals when, for example, there is still uncertainty surrounding the resident status of so many DACA students? Yeah. You know, I, I wish I could have an answer, and I, 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 I don't. I, I don't know um, with DACA students what we can do. Um, all I can offer to you is um, there is a website called Dreamers. Um, Sarai Salamanca is the co-founder of that, where she provides constant information on what's the, the, the newest, the most current information as to the status on that. Uh, it is going to be something that I, I'm not really sure what's going to happen. Um, I wish I had a better answer. I don't. The next question is from Cecilia Zamora. When you consider that many Latino families are ethnically mixed, 
how do marketers target Latinos when there are Black, Asian, and white family members? Is there a multicultural approach? And what would that be? Wow. You know, um, interesting, Cecilia, and thank you for the question. Good to hear from you. Um, when I was actually trying to uh, look for my eligibility status for uh, John F. Kennedy, I would ask the students, well, how do you identify yourself? And they would say to me, I'm not sure because I am Latino, African, and I'm Asian or white. So I don't know how I identify myself. And so from a perspective of offering, you know, services to, to our students, we all sort of fall into the same um, situation of underrepresented or underserved students or low income students. And so from marketing to that student to take advantage of the support services that any institution is offering is in that realm of that title, which I don't really uh, like, but that is the Department of Education's uh, definition of those who are underserved and low income that, can, uh, that there are other services and programs available to them. Uh, and so it's this issue of inclusiveness, of being able to just say the programs are for all, especially when we do know that we all are in need of some support. Yeah. Thank you. Next question. Representation in TV, music, and sports is a bit more obvious for most, but how important is it for that same level of representation in professions like teaching, healthcare, etc.? Well, I like to ask the audience that question. What do they think? Can we put them on the uh on speaker there to see if they can answer that question. That's an excellent question. Is there anyone uh, interested in responding? Can you allow them to chat? I think they can answer on the chat box. Uh, okay, we have, they can. You have not opened up the mic. You no, know, uh, we have representation in teaching is critical and that's um, from Dr. Luis Santiago. She's the director for the Graduate School of Education. Um, yeah, and we just, there was a post there. It said, if anyone wants to answer that, it could be placed in the chat. Yeah. And she said, and that's why we started the Diverse Educators Network to build out a pathway for students to become teachers and see this as a viable option. And you know, the other field for uh, representation is the mental health field. Uh, that which is something, you know, that um, with our culture, right, uh, we don't say very much. We hold everything close to our heart, what gives me cruz, right? And so that now is becoming a little bit much more uh, of uh, a greater need within our community. So then again, uh, more awareness, more uh, information on what these services are or what these fields are is what I think we need to do. We have another question from Maricela Barbosa. She asks, do you have information about the college graduation rate of Latinos mm -hmm. and what are the type of careers they are selecting? That's a great question. The assumption out there is that we Latinos focus on social work and that we don't have enough in STEM. And you know, it's an interesting question, Maricela. I don't have the numbers per se, but I can tell you from what I do know of what I've been doing is um, when anybody asks the question as to what our interest is in education or in fields and what are we going towards, then that's where people begin to identify. And so there, there are a number of folks that I believe are in STEM. Now we are focused on that because of a number of 
the lack of representation there. And so now we are focusing. We are going to focus, I'm sure after STEM, we're probably gonna have another focus on what we then now see as a gap that we need to ensure that there is representation. And so for, from a perspective of saying, what is the field, what is the next thing? Just like when we look at opportunities in law, we go through that gap. For Latinos, is STEM, absolutely. It is also in the fields of uh, medicine, but that focus has not yet been identified. So right now, Maricela, you're absolutely right. The focus is on STEM. And it's that not just the Latino. Again, the Latino do be due to the fact of the demographics and the gap, but it's also the focus there because of the country as a whole is seeing that we do not have numbers in STEM education. Here is a comment um, from Cecilia Zamora that I want to read to you. Connecting Latino students with Latino professional organizations is powerful. My niece is a mechanical engineering graduate who connected with the Hispanic Society of Engineers on her campus, and it provided her with many opportunities and connections. Her first job was as a high school teacher and was encouraged by a mentor she met at HSE. That's a comment. Thank you for that comment. Um, we have a question from Doris Banduro, and she was... <laughs> As you know, the census is currently going on. With regards to our community achieving their dreams, why do you feel the census is important? And what can we do to ensure that the Latino community does fill out the census? census? What message would share or would you share with the community to encourage them to apply? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, again, uh, Doris, it's, um, the lack, and I see the lack um, of the understanding of what it is and why it's so important. And it's because maybe they have never even heard of the services that their county state will be offering due to that census information. So they're not even aware of it. Our biggest concern within the Hispanic community is that lack of awareness. And so again, the messaging, and I know that we have seen it in, in Univision on the radio, but this is the first time that I can recall that the emphasis has been so strong. And so you have to also think about, you just can't change it overnight. We would have been doing this from what, five years ago, bringing that message over and over and over again to when we got to the point of the census now taking place. Yes, people would not hesitate in giving out the information of how many people live here, right? And so to me, unfortunately, it's the way we react is we need, get, we need to get something done tomorrow. Okay, well, we'll start communicating about it today and we just uh, hopefully they'll get the message. It doesn't work that way, especially when there are too many issues behind the uncertainty of our community with uh, you know, immigration and racism. Uh, you're gonna be skeptical and just telling me today is a good thing. Am I gonna believe it? Probably not. But if you teach me and you remind me and it's a constant message, then by the time it does get to me reacting, I will react. But overnight, it does not work. Thank you. Uh, another question. I had a Latino friend in high school who didn't speak Spanish, nor did his family, and he used to get made fun of from other Latino students for it. Can you discuss in broad terms about the troubles, identity issues like this can cause students? You know, that's a, uh, yeah, I've, uh, it, it's, 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 it does set you back, you know, uh, from the, even the thought of 
a child being born here and you go back to Mexico or Centroamerica, you're not Latino enough, you're not Mex Mexican enough, you're not Salvadorian enough. And when you come here and when you're here in the US, well, you're neither. <laughs> you don't speak the language, you probably don't even look like it, uh, you know, like a Latino brown face, typical brown face, right? So there is that differentiation. And so, yeah, from an identity perspective, it's difficult to try to even assimilate within your own little group. And I'm not talking about assimilation as a whole. I'm just talking about relating to others and within our own families. Um, El güerito or, you know, el morenito, all of those things, right? So to bring to perspective what, um, what we in our own culture talk about, and now students, you know, um, relating to that fact that they are neither. They don't speak the language. And so uh, more sensitivity awareness needs to be made with our teachers so that they can understand. And this is what I'm talking about, you know, when we talked about early on about representation the more people that we get in, uh, in uh, political offices, in health and education, the more awareness there will be on that culture sensitivity. And so this is what we need representation. We need to have more bilingual students, or sorry, bilingual teachers in our classrooms so that they can support that student through the so that, that they can actually relate to them and be able to understand and to answer questions when it comes to, well, which one am I, right? And the students react negative to that student who does not speak the language or even act like, quote unquote, a Latino. So I think more awareness, more representation uh, with our teachers in our schools is needed. And the messaging in support of that culture needs to be truly understood. There's, um, I think I, it's safe to say I relate a little bit with that question in um, regards to, I haven't been brought up in the East Coast. For me, because I was born in New York, I was, um, I'm not considered Hispanic Latino for folks when I went to Argentina, which is in our background. And it, I was not one of them per se. But when I come here, you know, I'm told I'm Hispanic Latina. So it's, it's, it's a very confusing, it was, it's not anymore identify, you know, you have to, I think, grow into that identity to embrace who you are, what you are. But I think for, for younger kids, it's very, it's very difficult trying to find, you know, in a situation, especially if you don't speak the language, trying to find that identity and, and realize who you are, what you are, what you bring to the table, but that takes time. Mm -hmm. And if I had those, those mentors, if I had those teachers telling me who, you know, the, or fo taking me in the direction I needed to go, that would have helped greatly. Of course, that's all in the generation years ago, you know, when I was growing up, that wasn't an option, but we have those resources now. And I think it's important that we continue this conversation and continue to, ed to educate our, our youth, you know, and that's so paramount to me because you do run into these identity issues sure. that eventually affect you in your life, you know, in, in your work or in your social life, in your family life, as you try to grasp for answers. You know, and this is why I think we continue to have the, that discussion about having uh, teachers that look like us, right? And it's even more than that. It's because you understand the culture nuances. Exactly. And so that is so important. And it, it's not about speaking the language, it's understanding the culture nuances. And, uh, and I think that we need to continue to, to push on that discussion that we do need. So that to your point, they would have been able to help you navigate, they would help us navigate this whole identity. Because just like the question that I asked the students at John F. Kennedy, are you, how do you identify yourself? 
Are you African American, Latino, or Asian? Well, my mother is a Latina, my father is African, the grandfather is fit. And they said, I don't know. And I'm being very sincere with you when I when they were responding to me, I don't know how to identify. And these were adults, students, and they were doubting themselves as to their own identity. And so it's something that we need to be very aware of, especially with young children. The fact that we need to create that inclusion and valuing diversity as a whole, right? Uh, that there's so much work that needs to be done. And you know, sometimes I, I wish that I could say, we've done this and we made changes and we're now onto the next phase. No, I actually co-sponsored an event in San Jose, at San Jose State, where we brought in Latino uh, youth in the programs. And they were just talking about certain interactions that they had had with either the counselors or their faculty. And one young man stood up and he said, I'm having a problem understanding this. And that is, I was just told that people like me will never make it. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's what we were saying 15 years ago. All of the work that I thought I had done to create change, to get people to see different views, different perspectives, has not changed much. And so it is a constant, right? It's a constant reminder because uh, the work is never done. It's a continuing process of creating this change in people's attitudes and perceptions and, uh, and respect and all of that comes along with it. It's a constant, it's a continuing work. Uh, but I, I was taken back and I thought, oh my gosh, I thought I had accomplished something. And no, it just set me back to say the work is not done. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this might be the final question, depending your response. And I think it's a great question. <laughs> With the presidential election on the horizon, do you think the day will come soon that we'll have a Latinx president? Wow, wouldn't that be great? You're fantastic. Doris, uh, Alma, you got my vote. <laughs> Wouldn't that be an amazing opportunity? Wouldn't that be an amazing opportunity? And there's no reason why we can't say, dream, believe, and act. <laughs> so I'm going to end on that note. <laughs> You know, we just and we still have a few more minutes. I'm going to ask a follow-up question to that. Speaking of the election coming up, how do you, based on just conversations you've had with um, your colleagues, based on what you're hearing in education, do you think we're going to have a large uh, Latinx turnout this year? There is a. I want to believe because I hear a lot of uh, anger, right? Um, I want to believe that we will have a huge response in the election. Uh, I hope that we take that ownership in uh, impacting not only, you know, the economy as we have and we pay our taxes and all of that, but that we actually take uh, the opportunity to vote and to have a good turnout in there. I'm hoping. Otherwise, again, it sets it back because here we've been working hard to create that awareness uh, that they have the power to create change within this country. Um, and we'll see, I'm hoping. In your circles with um, education, what are you hearing from the students? Do you feel that they're being proactive? They're really engaged in this year's election? It's a combination, it's a 50-50, you know, some are, some of them are just waiting. They just want to see who's going to fall and say something that will be negative. So it's a, it's a wait and see, which is not a good sign. You know, it's just a wait and see. It's just like they were waiting for the, uh, the debate. That was a disaster. 
now they're waiting for this debate that's happening tonight. Uh, so wait and see. You know, that's, that's a good point because I'm, the things that I'm hearing, you see the um, Latinos are divided. You know, mm -hmm. they don't, people think they're strictly Democrats and it's, there's a big division. And you're right, you know, what I have been hearing is, well, we'll see what happens. And they're really not making any decisions yet. They're waiting, right. you know, till November to decide, okay, I'll go this way. And then something else um, that I've been reading, and I think I'm gonna do a post on this, was you have the Black Latinos or Afro Latinos who are divided, you know, they don't know because one culture is telling them this, one culture is telling them that. And so they're on the fence and they're not really sure which way they wanna go with their vote. So I think that uh, it'll be interesting. This is something I don't believe anyone can forecast. I think we're just yeah, gonna have yeah. to see how it goes. Sure, I mean, Yeah, it's just sit and wait. It is. I wish we could say so no. We got, <laughs> We have a few, um, we have a couple of minutes left and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Is there anything um, that you would like to add, wrap up, any final thoughts uh, for your listeners out here? Well, first of all, thank you to my uh, followers. <laughs> no, no, thank you to, for everyone's uh, attending. You know, it's a, it's a commitment that we make uh, those of us who are educators say commitment is a responsibility to inform, uh, to, to create the awareness on the value of higher education. Because as I said earlier, it is the key to all doors, whether we are entrepreneurs or whether we go on to working with, for a big corporation, whatever that happens to be, uh, it is an opportunity you know, for us to, to create that change. Um, and so I see, you know, hopefully in the future that we will be able to talk about something totally different. But for now, it is that as educators, we have that responsibility to continue the awareness, to continue that support and to not give up. As I said, I was taken back by that one remark, just the, uh, four or five months ago, no more than that, six months ago, uh, where that student said, people like me do not make it. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh. So again, as educators and as business leaders, my hat's off to you in that you do see the opportunity, that you do see the changes that need to be made. And it's a constant. So I just wanted to, my hat's off to you and, and to thank you for taking on that leadership role in trying to create something that is inclusive and that is supporting of all cultures. Thanks. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Please join us next week. It is the last of our series. We will have Dr. Cesar Cruz who was a great partner with Dr. Judy Castro. And we look forward to that conversation. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.